Having now taken a look at the foundations of density functional theory from a theoretical perspective, let's now explore some of the early approximations that were employed in uh, attempting to apply density functional theory to chemistry. First, I'd like to explore again this intuitive idea that there is a mapping between the electron density and wave function theory. And to do that, let's recall on, on what does the Hamiltonian that appears in the Schrodinger equation actually depend? So what information do you need in order to have a Hamiltonian? Well, it, you really don't need much. What you do need to know is what atoms are you bringing together and where are they? So what are the positions and the atomic numbers for all of the nuclei? Moreover, uh, as you assemble those atoms, you will be bringing in a certain number of electrons, and so one needs to know how many electrons there are. Is it a neutral molecule? Is it a charged ion? There will be some integer number of them. So uh, we've talked about the electron density being a good physical observable. What is the electron density? So that's defined to be the number of electrons per unit volume in a given electronic state. That defines the electron density for that state. So this integral multiplied times the number of electrons over some arbitrary volume element will allow you to determine the density within that volume element. And then if we actually integrate the density over all space, so the density has units of per cubic uh, length unit, so per volume if you like. So when I integrate per volume with volume, I'll end up with just a number and that's what I want. I want the number of electrons. So the nuclei themselves are effectively point charges. Nuclei do have volume, and, and actually that volume gives rise to interesting properties when you get to really heavy nuclei. But nevertheless, for practical purposes now, we consider them to be point charges. And the positions of the nuclei can be identified within the electron density because it's at those positions you'll see local maxima in the density because, of course, the core electrons are centered on the nuclei and... Uh, as a result, you see increases in density as you approach nuclear positions. Moreover, if you remember the shape of a proper one electron orbital, they have cusps at the nuclei. And so the density also has a cusp, and that ought to be something that we could observe when uh, parsing through a, a density in space. So in order to then uh, construct this Hamiltonian from the density, what we'd like to do is use the density to assign the nuclear atomic numbers. We've already determined their positions. That's wherever there's a maximum, and that maximum has cusp properties. That is a nuclear position. But what nucleus is it? And it turns out the atomic number can, in fact, be determined from the electron density. And one can show that given a nucleus A, which is characterized by a nuclear charge, capital Z, the relationship between capital Z and the density is that the slope of the density, the change in the density if you like, as you move away from the nuclear position, spherically averaged, so this uh, bar over the top means you take the average of all the slopes since you can move out in, uh, in all directions in, in space from the nuclear position in all spherical directions, uh, there's this relationship. So given the slope and given the value of the density at the nuclear position, you can then determine the atomic number. Of course, we do not yet have any formalism for finding the energy from the electron density directly, but now we've basically seen that if we were given a density, we could find all the nuclear positions, assign the atomic numbers, integrate the density over all space, that'll give us the total number of electrons, and that's what we needed in order to solve the Schrodinger equation. Where are the atoms and how many electrons are there? So we could, in fact, determine the wave functions and energy eigenvalues that way. Now, uh, that's, that's not a practical approach, of course, to do density functional theory. The point was, can we get the energy without doing wave function theory? This is just an indication that it's reasonable to believe that the electron density might be a useful tool for getting at many of the things we get at with wave function theory. So let's think a little more about uh, what are the energy components associated with a molecular energy. Well, first, there is a kinetic energy and a potential energy component. And because we're treating this uh, much as we have in wave function theory with fixed nuclei, so we're not worried about the kinetic energies of the nuclei, they're clamped in space, but the electrons have kinetic energy, and they also have potential energy, 
through their interaction with the nuclei and through their interaction with each other. And so we're going to try to determine the molecular energy using only the electron density. So let's think about how we would do the individual components. Well, let's start with perhaps the easiest one, and that is the nuclear electron attraction. So I'll indicate that with this subscript NE for nuclear electron, and it's a potential energy, so I'll use V. So what is it as a function of the density? Well, I need to sum over all the nuclear positions, and remember I found them, and I found the atomic number by looking at the maxima in the density. And I'll integrate over all space the interaction of the density with that nuclear charge, and it depends on how far away is that little volume of density, R, so that's what R is measuring here, from the nuclear position. So that's pretty straightforward. That's, uh, it's a classical equation, and it also uh, ought to function well in this instance, where we do, in fact, have a continuous density. Now, if we did indeed have a classical charge distribution, that is just kind of a soup of negative charge, electron density, the electron-electron repulsion has also a relatively simple form. That is, there is a density, and every piece of that density, so I'll, I'll index the density by position, and I need two positions, because every piece at one position, call it R1, has an interaction with every other piece of the density, which might be at some arbitrary position R2. And I need to consider all of the interactions of the density. So I'm going to have to consider all possible values of R1 interacting with all other positions, so all possible values R2. The interaction will just be the magnitude of the charge times the magnitude of the charge divided by the distance between them. And so it's a double integral. And then finally, because it's always the same density, whether I take the piece at R1 interacting with R2 or I take the piece when this variable becomes R2 and this variable becomes R1, it's the same interaction, but I will have double counted it. So I just need to multiply times one half up front, and that is the classical charge-charge repulsion for a charge distribution that's continuous in space. Well, that's the potential energy. That's not so hard to write down, but what about the kinetic energy? How do you get the kinetic energy of a continuous charge distribution? That is not obvious. We don't really have particles moving around. We've just got this distribution. So Thomas and Fermi in the late 1920s uh, approached this by defining a fictitious substance. We'll call it jellium. So jellium is an infinite number of electrons moving in an infinite volume of space and that space is characterized by a uniformly distributed positive charge which exactly cancels out the net charge in space. That's also called a uniform electron gas, so it has a constant non-zero density everywhere in space. So it's, it's a fictitious substance, we can't really make it uh, easily, and this background charge certainly is not what we're used to thinking about in terms of space, but in any case, if you have this substance, you can use statistical mechanics to derive, and the kind of statistical mechanics you use are fermion statistical mechanics. So remember that no two fermions can have all the same quantum numbers, and uh, effectively that means that every level has a maximum number of occupations. And so if you look at the kinetic energy associated with particles in a box for a uniform electron gas, you can actually derive this equation. I'm not going to derive it. It's, it's not terribly difficult, but it's a little bit beyond what I want to talk about today. But in any case, the kinetic energy of a uniform electron gas depends on the density this way. So it depends on the 5 thirds power of the density, and then there's a whole bunch of constants that appear out front in order to get units right, basically. So at this stage, I've got my kinetic energy and my potential energy as functions only of the density, the density itself is a function of three spatial coordinates, x, y, and z, if you like. And uh, I'll just reiterate something that probably many of you uh, know from elementary calculus or the like, that when you have a function whose argument is itself a function, so t, for instance, is a function of rho, but rho is a function of r. Well, when that happens, we call this outermost function a functional. It takes a function as its argument. So T and V, as we've discussed them up till now, are so-called density functionals. So Thomas and Fermi took these expressions for T and V, and they combined them with an assumed variational principle. There's no proof that uh, anything is variational here. 
but you could now begin to play games of attempting to minimize the sum of t and v for a series of trial densities. And so this ener energy is being computed with no reference to a wave function. There's no solving the Hamiltonian equation here. Uh, you're just plugging in densities to those t and v expressions. Now, it turns out the Thomas Fermi model, which was sort of mildly interesting as an early, uh, early model in physics, has no use in modern quantum chemistry. Uh, to the Thomas Fermi model predicts that all molecules are unstable relative to their dissociation into atoms, which would make for a somewhat boring universe. Uh, and the biggest approximation, if you like, is the approximation of treating the electron-electron repulsion with this term. It's the first term here on the right-hand side of equation 5. It was equation 3 in an earlier slide. This treating the electron density as a classical charge distribution introduces very, very large errors. And so why is that? Well, if you think about uh, what's really going on, let's move to the next slide to look at that. So here's the, here is the proper expression for the electron-electron repulsion, right? It is 1 over r evaluated as an expectation value for all possible electron-electron interactions over the exact wave function. And so this term is for a classical charge distribution. And let's, let's take a, a concrete example to illustrate why you need another term to do this accurately. What if psi is actually a function of only a single electron? So in that case, n is 1, there is no i less than j, which is to say an electron does not repel itself, it's a fundamental particle. So there's no inter-electronic repulsion, but certainly one electron spread over space has a density associated with it. So when I take that density and I interact that density with itself, I will have repulsion. So the density will have inside it a charge-charge repulsion, and that's just wrong, it shouldn't be there. And in fact, in a many-electron system, uh, there's that effect of self-repulsion, and there are other effects associated with ignoring electron correlation and electron exchange. So in order to fix it up, we really we, there must be some other term, effectively, that will allow us to recapture the correct energy. And it's convenient to define something called a whole function, h. So the whole function can be thought of as something that is going to uh, have a negative value, so it's going to provide a negative compensation for an overly positive repulsion, and it, it's a potentially complicated function in a sense. Given a density at position R1, there is some function centered at position R1, but varying in value over uh, over variable R2 that's sort of hovering about every position of the density that will give you back your overcounting, your poor estimation of the electron-electron repulsion. Okay, and so uh, the most obvious whole function, the easiest one to see, is indeed for this one electron system. And so in that case, h must simply be the negative of the density. And let me go back since I don't have the equation on this slide. So remember, if there's only one electron, this value is zero. This is something. So what do I have to do to make this exactly cancel this? Well, I'll have to make h be exactly negative rho at, R, at every position r2. So h will be the negative of the density. And when I do that, I will, in fact, end up with this side being zero. So a whole function can be thought of as a property that an electron carries around with it that uh, allows one to compute the correction to a classical charge-charge repulsion in any system. Now, the trouble is that while in the one electron case, we know exactly what H is, it's the negative of the density, in the many electron case, we really don't have any clue of what this kind of complicated whole function should look like. Because it is correcting both for the self-interaction error, so that's the one that's obvious to see with one electron, and of course it'll be there with many electrons, but it also accounts for exchange and correlation energy in a many electron system, and we don't really have any idea how to extract that from a given electron density.
But in any case, let's, let's move a little bit forward in the history of quantum chemistry and go to the 1950s. And during this time, Slater was thinking about how to make Hartree-Fock calculations a bit faster. So Hartree-Fock, by its construction, actually avoids the self-interaction error, and it gets the exchange energy exactly. Of course, we know that it has problems with uh, electron correlation, but by construction, it deals with exchange. And if you wonder how it avoids this self-interaction error, you'll just remember that uh, we have these J integrals and we subtract K integrals. And it turns out that one of those K integrals that's being subtracted is indeed the uh, Coulomb integral of one electron with itself. So the, the Coulomb integral appears just as it does in the density functional expression, but by putting in exchange integrals, we subtract it away exactly, and it's just not a problem. So Slater was also thinking about, uh, in the many electron case, if you ask what's the contribution to the whole function that arises from exchange compared to correlation, well, the exchange whole is much larger if you want to think of it as, as having a, sort of a volume. And that's because two electrons of the same spin can't get close to each other because of uh, Pauli exclusion. Two electrons of opposite spin don't like to be close to one another because of electrostatic repulsion, but there's this an additional feature with Fermi exchange that uh, two electrons of the same spin are even less likely to be found close to one another. And on that basis, he said, well, let me forget about electron correlation for the moment. I'll only worry about exchange because uh, you can actually do sort of rigorous things and show that that exchange correction is one or two orders of magnitude bigger than the correlation. And uh, Slater wanted to replace the time-consuming calculation of exchange integrals, remember there are four index integrals, with some way to estimate the exchange that would be faster than that. And he said, well, let me make the following assumption. Let me say that the exchange hole about any position is equal to a sphere, right? And so that's an initial approximation, but a reasonable, a reasonable one perhaps, or at least one one can play with. And we'll make that a sphere of constant potential. And I'll expand that sphere out depending on the magnitude of the density at the position. And how will I do it? Well, I'll expand it out until it includes one electron's worth of density. And when you do that and you ask what is the exchange energy associated with that, you actually determine this expression. So this value alpha here in Slater's derivation is 1, and I'll explain why I, I care about giving it a variable name a little bit later. But in any case, a bunch of constants, and then you integrate over space rho to the 4 thirds. So uh, that defines something called Slater exchange. It's the Slater exchange energy. And I'm just going to offer a little challenge here that you might uh, try on the back of an envelope at some point uh, after this lecture or later today and satisfy yourself that 4 thirds, so that's an odd looking exponent, isn't it? Why on earth would the power of 4 thirds appear in something? So I would urge you to satisfy yourself that is the proper exponent in order to compute an energy. And if you remember in equation 4 earlier, that was the uh, Thomas Fermi kinetic energy, that had a 5 thirds exponent. So um, if you don't know exactly how to go about that, remember that density has units of its own that involve length. And after all, we're integrating over a, a volume, so that's like a length cubed. So try expanding density into its own intrinsic units and then see if, sure enough, this gives what you would expect for uh, final energy expression compared to, say, a Coulomb integral or an exchange integral. Well. To uh, close this lecture, I'd like to talk about kind of the early approach of using this Hartree-Fox-Slater uh, level of theory. And so when people tried to do calculations this way, they were called Hartree-Fox-Slater calculations. And so the idea was you would do a Hartree-Fox calculation, but instead of solving for all of the uh, four index integrals, which were very complicated and expensive, you would plug in this Slater expression for the exchange energy, and that would allow you to have a, a quick way to get at the energy of the system. It would scale better than n to the fourth. In practice, what people found was that rather than using an alpha value equal to 1, which derives from Slater, 
And it turns out that uh, earlier, Dirac had done a, a different analysis of how to compute exchange energy from the uniform electron gas and come up with a value of two-thirds for alpha. Now, in practice, uh, people who played around with treating alpha as an empirical parameter discovered that something roughly halfway in between, three-quarters, tended to give more accurate results when looking at, say, molecular geometries, spectra, what have you. And uh, that defined a level of theory that came to be called X-alpha. So it was exchange treated with this variable alpha in the Hartree-Flox-Slater way. And that, that saw a bit of use, particularly in the inorganic chemistry community, where Hartree-Fock theory can have uh, significant problems with open shell systems and systems with narrow frontier orbital separations. And people found X-alpha actually was mildly useful in those systems. But for the most part, the impact on chemistry was relatively minor. Now the physics community, on the other hand, found these to be tremendously useful models because of their locality. So not having to deal with the exchange integrals, which potentially interact things at, at big distances in space, really improves the scaling and allows you to compute energies and properties from uh, local phenomena. And solid state physics, for, in, for instance, found this to be quite useful. But in any case, we've, we've now traveled up to about the 50s, and DFT hasn't had a lot of impact on chemistry yet. But in the next series of videos, we'll look at the breakthroughs that took place that have uh, led to the, the adoption of density functionals in chemical calculations, and indeed in the 21st century, have led to density functional theory's dominance, probably, for uh, running calculations on a wide variety of systems.